having a little bit of free time before dinner. I'm Ellen Pythor, and this is Hi, Bobby Flowers. And we both are on the faculty at Stetson, <laughs> which is just a beautiful place, gorgeous law school. And the reason why I'm here, I've done a lot of talks at Cali throughout the years, usually talking about distance education or electronic education, as we call it. Um, but this year, I'm doing something very different. I've never presented here with someone else, and I was delighted that uh, Bobby Flowers is, is, is going to present with me, because if anybody can tell you how to convince your faculty, she can. Um, what we're going to talk about is distance learning or electronic education, but it really applies a lot to using other types of media and other types of media-related items in the classroom. And I've been the Associate Dean of Faculty Development and Electronic Education. I'm just finishing my third and final year. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the management side of it, and uh, Professor Flowers will talk about the faculty side. But before I get started into it, I thought to those who may have no idea at all, um, how many are doing distance learning out there? Okay. Define distance learning. That's exactly <laughs> what I was going to do, okay? I thought I'd just run through the rules really quickly. Um, our three goals today are first to convince you how to convince your faculty that you want to do this, uh, then to look at the administration side, and then finally the most important factor of all of the factors is why should you do it, and that is the students. And we'll talk a little bit about our students and the responses that we've gotten from our students in doing this. So what is electronic education, distance learning, anytime, anyone, anywhere, is the way we describe it, uh, and many others have described it that way. It gives an opportunity for students to be someplace else and be taking a class. It provides them with that flexibility. Standard 306 of the ABA actually defines distance learning for us in our world of law schools. And I went to the prior presentation where he said, don't put a lot of text up there. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of text up there, sorry. Um, distance education is an educational process characterized by the separation of time or place between instructor and student. It includes courses offered principally by means of, this is the part I really enjoy, okay? Video cassettes or discs or correspondence? Does that mean every time I send an email, I'm doing a distance learning course? In other words, this ABA rule is there. Um, I'm not sure it's completely up to date with what we see distance learning perhaps being, but that's how the ABA is defining it right now. There are many different types of distance learning. It can be web-based, it can be video conferencing, you can be using something like Illuminate, you can be using a Blackboard system, just using Twin or the Lexus system, which is a Blackboard system, could be distance learning. It might be something that is synchronous where you have the students in a room uh, using something like Illuminate or using, there are so many products out there at this point, or it can be asynchronous, which is what we do for the most part at Stetson, which provides that 24-7 flexibility. Or it could be hybrid, the live class and the distance learning. What are the rules with the ABA? Basically, I'm condensing them down. I'm not going to put up the text of the whole rule, but to condense it down, you must have approval from the curriculum committee. That means that normal approval for the course is not going to be sufficient for the ABA. They want a separate approval as a distance learning course. So what we do is we take the course that's previously been approved as a, a live class, 
We send it back to our curriculum committee with an attachment of how we're going to do it as a distance learning class, and they approve it as a separate distance learning class. You have to have ample interaction. What's ample interaction? I'm not quite sure, but we'll give you some examples of the type of interaction we've been getting and how it's better than the live classroom. And so meeting that standard we found to be extremely easy. <clears throat> ample monitoring. Almost every type of system that you're going to be using, whether it's a twin system, a blackboard system, angel, no matter what system, what's left of the systems out there, has some type of monitoring within it. So it's usually very simple to get the monitoring, to know if the students have been there, to know if they're participating. In our case, we do a certain number of posts each week that a student has to make, so it's very easy to see whether the students are participating or not participating. The ABA also says you can have a maximum of four hours in any term. So that's a very restrictive policy. That means pretty much for us that unless there are two credit courses, we're only going to be allowing a student usually one class in the summertime or maybe one to two classes during a semester. They have not opened that up yet. A maximum of 12 hours for the JD. Okay, So it's a very limited amount that you can use for distance learning in the law school curriculum to have the approval of the ABA. No first year courses, okay? You have to have 28 hours in before you're permitted to have a distance learning course taken by a student, which pretty much eliminates all the required first year courses. However, however, <laughs> when you get down to the interpretations, it tells you that courses in which two thirds or more of the course instruction consists of regular classroom instruction shall not be treated as distance education. So that basically means you can do a lot of distance education in a lot of different classes, first year classes, second and third year classes, and really not have to contend with 306 in the ABA. Now I will say that in past years when I gave this talk, I said, well, there's really no monitoring, you're under the wire. That's not the case. They do report now and do require reporting now every time that you do use any type of distance learning in the classroom. So it's very important to keep track if you are going to have faculty who are doing some type of distance learning in a class. But you don't need approval of the curriculum committee or anything like right, that? Right, exactly. You, you do have to have the interaction. Hour. The interaction is still required. Um, again, very easy to do but you don't have to have the rest of the standard. It's pretty much not. There's now the Higher Education Act, which was just recently came into effect. Um, I mention it with a lot of uncertainty because I really don't know where law schools are going to come out on the Higher Education Act. It requires that we be able to prove that the student who is getting the credit in the course is the same student who completed the course. Um, how you accomplish that, there are all types of products out there right now that they're trying to sell. People are trying to sell products such as ones that will monitor the click strokes of students while they're taking the exam. Um, some people use proctors for their exams. Um, again, one of the things I would emphasize in looking at this rule is that offers, um, registers a program, it, it speaks to your accrediting agency. I have yet to see anything coming out of the ABA that relates to the Higher Education Act. Now, we do have SACs in our case, we're in the southern states, and there may be some type of state accreditation that you may have that deals with this Higher Education Act. 
I just point this out to you as something to watch for. We have put into place certain things to try to meet the Higher Education Act to make certain that the same student as the one who's getting the credit is actually taking the exam, which really is not as difficult as it may seem because most of your systems are password protected, most of you have security, and most of you, if you're going to have a distance learning course, are going to have an enormous amount of involvement with the students and you get to know the students in that class very well. Okay, so let me turn it over now to the fun part of why you're here. And uh, Professor Flowers is going to tell us a little bit about convincing faculty. I have to tell you that when she first started doing distance learning, I didn't think we could convince faculty. I wasn't <laughs> sure this was going to work. Okay, so we have seen an enormous transition. Can I? Um, let me just tell you a little bit about my background. I came to Stetson as a trial lawyer. I was a trial lawyer for many years. I love the classroom because it feels kind of like trial work. So, you know, convincing me that I wasn't going to be in a classroom was going to be, the, be a tough, tough call. Um, I've always loved teaching. I've been teaching for, oh gosh, I can't remember to say this, 16 years. Um, I started as a very small <coughs> child. Um, and so, I, you know, I love the classroom environment. I, I love being in the classroom. I love watching their faces and seeing them nod their heads or seeing them roll their eyes or whatever they're doing um, at that moment. And so when I was first approached to do an online course, I didn't want to do it. And the reason I was approached by it, approached about it, was that we had created an LLM <coughs> program um, for elder law. And my best friend on the faculty is this elder law guru. And she and I had done several courses on ethics and elder law across the country. And so she, it was just natural that I would be the one that would do it in this LLM program. Well, our LLM program is totally online. We have uh, amazing practitioners from all over the country that have tons more experience in elder law than I have ever hoped to have um, taking this LLM course. So, on top of the fact that I wasn't sure I wanted to give up a class, because I had to give up a class to do it. Um, number two, I wasn't sure I wanted to do online classes at all. And number three, I had a bunch of students that knew more than I was, and I wasn't going to be able to see their faces when they went, this woman doesn't know what the heck she's talking about. Um, and so I was very reluctant when I first started out um, teaching on the online, um, in the online area. Um, I will tell you, I have become convinced. And I've become convinced um, for a variety of reasons I want to share with you that maybe you can use to convince your faculty. Um, since that time, I've taught a JD course online um, two summers, um, and it's been wonderful, just wonderful. And we're going to talk at the, kind of the end of this presentation that uh, Dean, I was going to call her Dean Piper because that sounds really good. Um, Ellen and I will say to you, we don't believe that every class should be taught online. That's just not true. I mean, there are some courses that should not be taught online. And, um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. But I want to talk about three concerns that faculty like myself are going to have when you start talking to them about this thing called online education and maybe help you come up with some answers um, for those questions. The first concern is student engagement, right? How am I going to engage students um, when they are sitting at home in their bathrobe at 2 a.m. in the morning um, eating popcorn and probably watching reruns of you know, CSI or something at the same time that they're watching my lectures. So how am I going to engage them? What are some things I can do to engage them? Can I create some sort of a, uh, an interesting lecture? Because we use, and, and I love it when Ellen uses all these words, because I'm sitting there thinking I'm already lost. She's talking complete, a different language for me. Um, we use a system called Blackboard. That's all I know. We use a system called Blackboard, but it means to me that I stand in front of this camera after I've created my PowerPoint, and I do a lecture. So my first question was, can I begin to engage my students through these lectures? Well, the truth is, every faculty member, when they first start out, um, are very nervous about lecturing to a camera. It's not the same. And one of the things that we did very early on when I first started is my colleague, who hasn't gotten into this, uh, Professor Morgan and I, she would watch my lectures and I would watch them, <coughs> which gave me someone to speak to. And it was just an easy thing to talk somebody into sitting there in the room with me, but it helped me. And even now, our camera person, because we now have a camera person that does the, the shooting for us, 
She's very engaged with me. She gives me, you know, so one of the things you can talk to your faculty about is you can have somebody in the room with you. Somebody that you're talking to and they're listening and you're, you're feeling like you're engaging with them. Very simple thing to do, but it helped me a lot. Now, now I can probably do it without anybody in there just because I'm used to doing it. But when I first did it, it was very unnerving to be staring at this, you know, and we kept trying to figure out ways to get my eye contact to be right. So we had to keep moving up things. So it was like right here, so I would be reading it, looking at it. Um, and so one of the things is to have maybe people in the, in the, in the room with you. Um, one of the things that um, I was very concerned about was, well, wait a second. How am I going to engage students in the discussion, all right? And I'm going to tell you, I'm convinced without a doubt that in so many ways, my students on my online courses are more engaged in my material than are in my in-person classes. And I think I'm a pretty darn good teacher. Of course, we all do, right? But because we require postings every week. So here's how it works in my classes. At the beginning of the week, whichever day we have decided is the beginning of the week for this class, say it's Tuesday, at 5 o'clock, my lectures will go online. And the students will have the whole week to watch those lectures. Um, but my, my lectures are set so that they have to read the materials first and click on they've read it. And they get to watch the first lecture, show they've read, they've watched that one. You know, I mean, obviously they can lie about it, but you hope they don't. Um, and then they have to go on what we call the discussion board. And we require in our courses that they post four times. Two of those must be original, substantive, postings, which means they have to have some original thought about what I'm talking about. And two must be response postings, i.e. they have to listen to what the other folks are saying and respond to it. I'm going to tell you, first of all, I don't know, I have a class of 45 people in a live class. How many people are engaged in my class in one given week in the actual engagement of the material? Well, I can only call on so many people, but in my online class, Every single student has to post substantively using the lectures. They have to cite to the lectures. They have to cite to the reading materials. They have to cite, in my case, rules, because I do all um, ethics classes online. And so they have to do that. I am telling you, I know that my students are having to pay attention to the work that I am having them do every single week. Because at the end of the week, everything disappears. So if they haven't posted, they're considered absent for the week. I don't care what they've done. They're considered absent for the week. Um, all the lectures go down. They can't go onto the discussion board and write anything else. They can still read the discussion board uh, posts, but they can't post themselves. And so I know that at the end of the week, I know every one of my students has had to at least do a darn good job of pretending like they read the material, like they heard the lectures, because they have to actually cite them which is very different than a live course, um, where you know that you have students that can hide out for an entire semester. And I am telling you what speaks to the heart of most faculty that I know is the idea that students are really weekly, daily engaged in what you're talking about. Not basically sitting there waiting until the end of the semester and they can take the exam. And so one of the things that really convinced me, and I wasn't convinced when I started, um, was the fact that students really are engaged in the materials if you force them to be. And this forces them to be in a way that is more difficult to do in a um, non-online course. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that helps with the lectures is obviously the PowerPoints. Being very careful about the PowerPoints when we were laughing when we were looking at Ellen's PowerPoint this afternoon because it was like, ooh, we're violating all the rules of PowerPoints. But to be very, very careful about the PowerPoints you put up um, remember, one of the great things about it is that the students can take that PowerPoint then and use it for their notes. They can watch the lectures several times if they want. Um, again, because different students learn differently. And faculty members know that. I mean, I know that there are people out there that are going to learn by hearing me. They're going to they're gonna be uh, students out there that learn by seeing something. They're going to be students out there that, that have to have some sort of hands-on thing. And so, I am convinced the online course really, really teaches in a variety of different ways that's very helpful. Um, in all of my classes, I also have videos that they watch because we've created video scenarios. And so they watch a video scenario between the lawyer and the client, and then that's part of the discussion. 
Let's discuss what this lawyer did right. Let's discuss what this lawyer did really bad. Um, and that starts the discussion. All right, so um, student engagement. I can tell you I have become convinced that it really um, is an improvement. Technology. I don't know about y'all, but most of us on the faculty um, really are not very technologically savvy. And obviously the new kids on the block, the new students, or the new faculty that are coming along are much more savvy in this area than I am um, and my kind of my colleagues that are my age. Um, and so one of the things that concerned me was I'm not technologically savvy. I don't know how to do all of this stuff. Well, I will tell you, a couple of things are very helpful. When you have an administration or you have somebody that is a dedicated person in your administration that is willing to sit down with you and say, okay, here's how you, how you navigate this. And Blackboard, the system we use, is very simple, thank goodness. But I also had a great administrator, Dean Podgore, who would go on and say, oh, you know, Bobby, you got all this listed out. Now let me tell you how you can go in and take out some of that stuff so it works better. It looks better, it works better. So that I didn't have to learn how to be a techie. You know, I have never had to buy a little pocket protector since so going on this. Um, that was a joke, guys. I always tell my students that was a joke. They don't get any funnier than that. Um, but I haven't had to learn all the technology in order to be what I think is a good online teacher. Um, and you have to convince the faculty of that, that they don't need to have that kind of technology. They don't have to be savvy. Um, one of the things that, and I'm gonna tell you, no marriage is great the first year, okay? I'm sorry, no marriage is great the first year. And neither is the first year you teach an online class. It's, there's a lot of, you know, you gotta work through it. And we started this program from scratch. We had Dean Pogger there, it was her first year. And so there were some things that we had to kind of learn how to do. But I can tell you, if you can put into place some real good technological support for your faculty, that's the way you convince them. If you can show them, here is what we're gonna do, here's what we're gonna do for you on the tech side, you don't need to worry about that side. You don't have to learn about that side. What you need to do is you need to create what you're good at creating. We're not gonna ask you to do something that's not in your skill set. Technology is not in my skill set. What's in my skill set is to create a PowerPoint and to do a lecture. And so they were able to, um, again, take that technology, first of all, because most of the products that are out there right now, you know, at least the ones that we have, are very, very user-friendly. I mean, very user-friendly. But understand, when I started Blackboard, I had never even used Twin, okay, never. I mean, I was one of those people that thought I was using distance learning because I knew how to email. Um, I know nothing about technology. And so technology support is really important from a faculty perspective of my, on my side of it. Um, and you've got to be able to convince them that, that this is not going to be difficult. Because, I mean, I know that everybody is busy. But faculty believe that they are very, 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 very busy, right? And so you've got to be very cognizant of the fact that there's a time issue. Now, I'm going to tell you. Yes, that first semester, it takes a lot of time. It probably takes more time than it takes to do a regular class, and you have to be up front with it. But let me tell you, the second time you do that class, not nearly as much time. The third time, not nearly as much. Now, I go back in and re-watch re my tapes each time. Okay, that's the most torturous part, so don't tell everybody over there to do that. Um, but I go back in and watch my tapes to see whether there's something that's changed in the law or something that I've learned now that I'd like to add to my lectures or what I end up doing is realizing that I've said something that's very specific to that semester and so it's not going to work for this semester because that was a six week summer semester and this is a 13 week and I'm saying now we're in week 10. Well we're not in week 10, we're in week 4. So you know those little glitches. Um, but as you watch the videotape, um, you, you realize that you know what? You, you can be engaging. You can talk to a camera and still engage um, people out there. Um, and so the technology support is a really important one and you want to convince your faculty that even though it may take time the first time, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like making an exam, right? Some exams take a lot of time up front, but boy, they almost grade themselves. Some are really easy to write up front, but then it takes forever to grade them. Well, this is kind of the way it is with this kind of a class. 
a lot of upfront work that first semester, but by the second semester that you do it, it's half the amount of work, if not a third of the amount of work. And by the third semester, you've worked out a lot of those glitches, and it really is a class that all you're doing is enjoying reading those, those um, postings from your students and seeing them learn. I mean, you're see I mean, what faculty have to understand is they're seeing their students learn. I mean, isn't that the best part about teaching, is to teach a concept and see them that they've learned it? You know what, in, in online education, you get to see, ah, they did get that. They did take that thing from my lecture, and they did apply it to this fact scenario, and they got it, and they got it. And so that's, it. that's, that's just a great selling point for me. Finally, when I first did this, of course, I was like, but how do I do this, okay? I've said I'll do it, now how do I do it? How do I put together this class? Well, I'm gonna suggest to you that there's a lot of stuff out there on how to put together a distance learning class. Um, and I know Ellen's gonna talk a little bit about, we have um, up on our Blackboard, um, basically a step-by-step -step on how to put together an online class. And I know that um, Ellen's gonna tell you how we make that available to you. You know, how to put together the syllabus. I know for me it was, okay, I want to grade, we grade our postings. So that also encourages, you know, because we grade them. How do I grade them? How do I go about doing that? Kind of like with exams. How do I, how do I make it as um, objective as I possibly can? And so I got that from somebody else, you know, a four-point scale. And how do I four-point it? And tell them students exactly, this is what I'm looking for if you want four points at posting. This is what I'm looking for if you want three points. This is what I'm looking for, two points. And if all you say is, yep, good point, that's, that's going to get you zero points. I don't want you just to tell me, oh, you, that other person had a good point. Um, and so that was very helpful. The syllabus is very helpful. Um, a couple of things that, that I tried in some semesters has worked, just like in a regular class, some that hasn't. In addition to the postings, my summer criminal ethics class, I require <coughs> the students to do group projects. And I also require in the Yellow Learn program. The group projects in the um, JD program are very different than the group projects in the Yellow Learn program. The group projects in the Yellow Learn program are very fun because they're very practical. So I will say, get together as a group and write what you would make as an office policy to give to your staff in order to make sure that you are complying with this rule. And so they get together and they write up these office policies. And because they're practitioners, they go, oh wait, I'm going to use that. Wow, we got this new waiver form. I'm going to use that. So that's been very fun for them. But that's very difficult for them as practitioners to be able to, to kind of go online. But we have like a little group, and they go into their group page, and they talk among themselves, and they come out with a, with a group project. So I do group projects. Now, students hate group projects, don't they? I mean, they hate them in the classroom. They hate, they even hate the work. But what I say to them is, you know what? We don't practice law by ourselves. Even if you're a sole practitioner, if you've got staff, you've got people you have to work with. You have to learn to work with people. And guess what? Some people work really hard, and guess what? Some people won't work at all. And you've got to learn how to deal with those kinds of people. So I tell them at the very beginning, my, one of my first lectures, I say, look, we're going to have group projects. And I'm going to tell you exactly what I tell my three kids. It's like breakfast. It's good for you. I don't care if you don't like it. Just eat it. Okay? And so... <laughs> One of the wonderful things about being tenured, what do you, you know, what, for your right say, she told me. Okay, so one of the things is how do I create the materials? In a lot of ways, faculty to understand, it's not that different. I mean, it feels so much different, but in reality, it's not that much different than creating a syllabus, you know, the same kind of syllabus you would have um, for a in-person um, class. You're going to have a syllabus. You're going to walk through what you want to cover each week. You're going to, in some ways, I think my classes are probably a little bit more organized because I don't use PowerPoint in the classroom. I do use it on the online lectures. And it, I realize it keeps me kind of on task as opposed to going here and there and all over the place. And so that's, again, for me, that's been, a, been an eye-opener to show that my lectures are probably a little bit more concise and... Um, pointed and focused than maybe my uh, in-class stuff. And that's one of the things that the Congress said to me over and over and over again. 10, 15 minute lectures, not hour long lectures. You cut 
your um, lectures into little bites. Every class has, you know, three or four different top, not topics, but at least issues that you can cut your lectures into. Will you cut your lectures into that so the students can watch 10 or 15 minutes? Number one, they're going to stay engaged longer because they're, okay, I've got 15 minutes, I can sit here for 15 minutes. I got an hour long lecture, you know what, halfway through it, I, I have to go. I've got to go do something. I'm not going to sit here for an hour and watch a lecture. And so that's helpful too. And it also feels better from a faculty perspective. I can talk for 15 minutes. That's not that hard. You tell me I'm going to have to stand in front of a camera for an hour talking to a camera, that's a little intimidating. But a 10 or 15 minute lecture, sure, on different topics work for me. And that, that came from, um, from Ellen. So those were my three concerns and how they have been kind of over the last, what have we done this, three years now? Three years now, um, I've become not a skeptic, but actually a, um, in the right class, um, a supporter. Now, the administrative side. I should tell you the first time I did a distance learning, I called it distance learning that year, Chris Heaton was back there. Um, no money, nothing. We had no equipment. We did it all basically for free. And what she put together was amazing. That course was used by Katrina students um, after the storm who were scattered across the United States. And uh, thanks to both Georgia State and Stetson who allowed me to use that particular course during that period of time. Uh, it, was, it was really a wonderful thing to have the ability to serve those students and um, the administrative considerations. Now that I've been in this administrative role and looking at, and some of you I know are in the administrative role, of putting this together, I thought I'd throw out a few things that I have found very helpful, or shall I say, the mistakes I have made along the way is the better way of putting it. The first thing is support. It's very difficult to do this if you don't have tech support, the electronic education equipment, or somebody who can help you get that equipment. And you can't do it unless you get that faculty on board and explain to them it's going to take a lot of time. And it's important to make the administration realize it's going to take a lot of time and that this has to count as one of their courses. And that the first year they do it, it's really more than a course. And explaining that to the administration and making sure they're on board before you actually get into it, I think is very important because it's an extremely time consuming process that first year of putting it together. Having the tech support, again, there is a range of different equipment out there. We're at the high tech end right now. We have our own studio on campus. We have an LLM program. We have several other programs. We'll show a little bit of some of those programs in a few minutes. Um, we also, we use Accordion technology, which captures the uh, person speaking and the PowerPoints, puts them together and has it up online within a one minute period of time. And there's many other technologies that do the same thing out there. Um, but you can do it without that, and without that high cost also. The second consideration that I learned in the process of setting up a distance learning and electronic education program was the importance of thinking it through up front and setting it up in advance. And I, I put as my first one the database. We just kept recording. We were recording one video, or vodcast as we call them, one after another, and then it suddenly dawned on us we needed to find one of them. <laughs> and well, great, it's, it's done in a chronological order, so we have them numbered, but looking for it, we needed a database system. We now have a construct database system that does it by course types, that has um, not only the dates, the faculty member, it's all in a searchable function. And so I think setting up a database before you get started and thinking through the database is very important. 
Second thing I mentioned is the backup plan. We are in hurricane territory where we are, so I've thought a lot about backup plans and what we would do if we're suddenly down for two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. And I think it's important to think about that backup plan. How are you going to notify the students if you're suddenly down? What type of alternative arrangement do you have <coughs> to contact them, especially if the students are not there on campus? If they're there on campus and they're alive, they know it's a hurricane. But if they're in another part of the world, they have no clue. Maybe they've gone on and figured it out after a couple hours. There's a hurricane going on. But you need to be able to have some notification systems. You need to have some type of backup plan in place. And the third thing is we call it e-help. We set up a separate system for students to contact if they were having a technology problem with the electronic education. Instead of going directly through IT, where you may have several people in IT who are very knowledgeable in what you're doing, but they don't know that this particular student is taking a distance learning course, or that the problem is related to a distance learning course. We set up a separate line, an e-help line, that they can write to and get certain people who are on it who are very geared towards the e-help function for electronic education and can provide them with the immediate answers that they might need. So I strongly suggest that. Also, if you have a complete program that's online, think about the fact that those students are not on campus. They've never met the registrar. They don't know about your student services on campus. And if they start getting the lunch menu from your cafe in their email systems and clogging up their email systems, they're not going to like it very much. So you have to think in terms of these students are different and setting up a different construct for them. The third thing, or the third consideration, is the fact that it's not right for every class and the fact that this generation wants distance learning. We have probably we're up to about eight, nine courses in our distance learning. I'll give you our website so you can go on and see what we've got there. One of the first things that I have done in the past two years, after my first year, was I couldn't answer everybody's questions. It was getting to be too much. I was down to two hours of sleep a night. And I needed some way to be able to let faculty know how they can do this distance learning without repeating it each time. And so exactly what I did is I created a course. And it's called Creating a Distance Learning Course. And it is all online. We require all of our adjuncts to go through the course and take the course before they actually teach one of our distance learning courses. The course includes a section where everybody who's teaching in our distance learning program can put up what's worked for them. All of the things, things like the different icebreakers they've used to get the students engaged initially. What's worked, what doesn't work. Things about Blackboard that they found difficult to use and how they overcame the problems that they're having. So we have that structure in place now and we have an electronic education assistant now so it's real easy for me to step back and go back to teaching white collar crime and international criminal law, which is where my heart is. But this has really been fun. And the reason it's been fun and the reason I've enjoyed it so much is because of the students. It's not right for every class. I'll let uh, Professor Flowers talk about this. Um, one of the things that I think every faculty needs to understand is that this is not the the right thing for every course. Um, obviously, at Stetson, we do a lot of advocacy, skills type training. Um, we're going to talk a few minutes about how we use distance learning in that situation. But obviously, a full distance learning course, I'm not convinced is going to work in a skills class. I know there's schools that do it, and you know, if they can show me a way to do it, I, I'll be more than happy to listen. But I'm just not convinced you can do those skills courses totally online. I think there are some ways you can use online to make your in class better but I don't think those courses are. Um, I'm going to also tell you that I haven't been convinced, and we've seen it in our LLM program. I'm not convinced how well this medium works for classes where um, 
I don't want to use there's a right answer, but like for our tax classes, our estate gift tax classes, it's been more difficult to create because when they post, you're posting something that really requires them to put a right answer in, and then if the first person puts the right answer in, there's some problems with the, the people after that. So that's a difficult course. I, for one, would never use it in my evidence class. I don't think it's the right medium for an evidence class. I think an evidence class has to have that synchronized argument, 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 argument. I think that that spontaneity is required for that course. So I'm not convinced that those, course, those sorts of courses. I'm not sure about real, true statutory interpretation courses. I'm not sure how well they're going to do. So, you know, I mean, I, I could be proven wrong, obviously. But I do think if you're starting an online class, I think you want to be, or an online program, you want to be cognizant of what kind of classes is most likely going to work the best. I'm going to tell you, I think for ethics, it works phenomenally because it really allows for the students to really kind of engage in the discussion of ethics. Um, so we do a criminal ethics course online. We do um, our LLM, um, Elder Law Ethics class online, and it's worked very well. Um, but I don't think it's right for every class. So from my faculty perspective, I wouldn't be convinced you could go out and sell it to every faculty member as a panacea for every class. I should say we do an HC for this model. Right. So some of those concerns may be alleviated in right. um, a synchronous model that did have the students engaged at the same time. But if you do that, you are going to lose some of that flexibility with the students. Something to keep in mind about doing distance learning, and that is that the students who are coming into the law schools, they know it, they're familiar with it, and many of the top institutions in the United States are requiring their students to take at least one distance learning course before they graduate. So I am finding more and more on our evaluations that students have experienced distance learning before or they are coming to law school. So it's something to keep in mind that it may be new for us, it's not new for many of them. The students, they love it. They love the flexibility, they love the fact that it's open 24-7. For students where English is a second language, the fact that they can view the material multiple times is an incredible step. We have wait lists like you cannot believe for our distance learning courses. And not because they are easier, because on our evaluations we ask the question, and routinely the students say they do more work in an electronic education class than they do in the live class, and yet they still want more. And one of the key things, I think, is the flexibility and the fact that they can go to it 24 seven and do it at their own speed. They can make sure they're learning the material. Again, the three different styles of learning, seeing, doing, and hearing are all there for them. Some of our student comments. It reduces the spontaneity, but responses tend to be more reasoned and accurate. Whatever doubts I had about distance learning are all gone. And Again, violating all the PowerPoint <laughs> rules. I've used this one before if you've seen my prior presentations, but this one really says it all to me. Usually in a regular classroom, there are several students who provide well thought out answers to a professor's inquiry. After several class sessions, the others in the class who are less vocal or are unsure of their answers, let the others provide the input. I like the idea that I heard, actually read, the thoughts and opinions of everyone in the class. No one voice was able to drown out the response of other persons. I hope that you continue to provide distance learning classes in the future. This is the type of response, I've used this one several times, but I've gotten so many of this type of response from our students taking distance learning courses. They want more, they enjoy it, they like it, and it's what they want. The train has left the station. I mean, everybody who is thinking about distance learning, they're out there, they're doing it already. And I think it's something, as law schools, we need to start thinking about more. Because it is what our students want, and the new generation of students that are coming into law schools, they're going to appreciate this. 
I wanted to close by showing you just two things that we're doing over at Stetson. We have an electronic education page up at the top. You can see the website for it if you'd like to go on. It has some resources on there um, that are provided. It tells you about some of the programs that we have, and it tells you about what courses we offer. Our courses are internal. We're not trying to sell any courses here um, to other schools. I've taught, I've taught distance learning where I've had as many as four different institutions. I actually went out and bought sweatshirts for every single institution, and while we were taping, wore the different sweatshirts of different occasions to try to bring in the whole group. I don't quite do that anymore. Um, we're mostly an internal type situation now. But this will give you some of the different things that we are doing. One of the things I will mention is our overview of United States law. This is one that is available outside our law school. It's a project. Um, LexisNexis has published the book that goes with this online course. It's a course for LLM students who are coming to the United States and want to get an overview of the United States system before they actually come here. It provides two hours of 17 different subjects, all of the first year subjects, most of the required subjects, and then a few hot topics like intellectual property. So a student can go on and watch tax for two hours before they actually come to the United States and take the tax class here. It allows them to learn some of the vocabulary in advance and also gives them an overview of that particular subject. The course also provides an overview of the United States system for those who may be coming from a civil system. The course is particularly good for those LLM students. It's also good if you have an at-risk program or an academic success type program at your law school and you want to meet those students before they actually start to help them along. It may be students who have been out of law school for 15 years and have not been back in a classroom and may need a head start before they start up law school. Or it may be students who have lower LSATs, or it may be students who have a second language, or it may be students coming in with a science background. So these are the type of students who may find beneficial our U.S. Overview Project, which contains the course. The course is about 35 hours long, and it contains a book that goes with the course. And if anyone's interested in that, just contact me, and we can set up your school with that. We do charge for that one. Um, and Professor Flowers is going to tell you a little bit about our advocacy resource center that we don't charge for, and it's available to everyone. Um, our Advocacy Resource Center is what we call our ARC because we had to come up with, you know, acronyms for everything. Um, basically, what we use this for and what we suggest people use this for is for their skills courses. Because basically, if you have a skills course, you have a pre-trial course, you have a trial advocacy course. These are very short lectures on the different segments of your skills course that students can watch before they do come to class to do the skill. So it's a way to kind of back up you know, they're supposed to read the stuff and they're supposed to write an opening statement. Well, they can go on to our ARC, or you can create your own ARC. I'm not suggesting you have to do ours. You can create your own series of lectures on those different parts of the skills so that you can eliminate that time that's required in the skills course and use it more for them getting up on their feet and them doing the opening statement, them getting up on their feet and them doing a deposition or them working on client counseling skills. And so we've created one that has basically from pre-trial all the way through um, the appellate advocacy program. And if you go on, online um, under our advocacy, I think it's under our Centers for Excellence in Advocacy, right. and then you go to the advocacy page, you can go on here and see all of the different lectures that students can use. So, for example, if I teach trial ad, I'll say to my students, okay, we're doing opening statements next week. You need to go on to the ARC, you need to see, we call them ATMs, um, advocacy training modules. Uh, you have to watch the ATM on opening statements. And so then they can watch it, and that gives them a more of a comfort level. Because I don't know about you, but if you've ever taught a skills class, what the thing they hate is, why didn't you tell us what to do before we did it? And you'll say, well, but you had a reading assignment to tell you what to do, but they don't feel as comfortable as if you've given them a lecture. So this gives them a lecture to watch. We have some um, demonstrations on ours um, that you might want to tape if you had really good students that you wanted to do a demonstration of an opening statement students could walk it, watch the demonstration, and then they'd be prepared to do it. So this is a great way, we've done it, but you can certainly create it within your own web page, 
a, a great way of using distance learning um, as a supplement to a skills course um, to allow for the students to get some lecture before they come in and try to do the skill that they're trying to teach. Um, and so that's another way to do distance learning in the area of skills um, training. Uh, Professor Flowers started the entire Advocacy Resource Center up here. And I should tell you, right now it is extensive. There are just numerous tapes up there, including some leading people like Terrence McCarthy on cross-examination. And we've had other top individuals in the United States. The minute we get them on campus, we throw them in our studio. <laughs> and we ask them, just give us 15 minutes, or just give us 20 minutes. And before you know, we've got several hours worth of tapes. And it's created an incredible resource for the students. And most of the tapes are usually between 15 and 20 minutes. Some of them, like I used to say, is you have to have a commercial if you're going to go more than a certain period of time. So you need to have some type of interaction, some type of commercial in there. And, and the types of tapes that are listed here, I used to, when I gave this talk, I just brought up the entire thing with all the tapes. We now have organized the entire structure here, and uh, it's all done by categories now, so they're very easy to find all of the different tapes. You'll see the pre-trial, the trial. We have the Masters of Advocacy series, and that brings in many of the lecturers. And again, this is completely available to any student out there, any faculty member out there that you can use in your classes. Um, you have to sign in a username and password, but there is no charge whatsoever for anyone who's a public defender um, or related to a law school in any way whatsoever. So I know everybody wants to get to dinner, uh, but if we can answer any questions, we're happy to stick around. Um, I can tell you that I have really enjoyed the distance learning. I'm going to continue teaching in our distance learning program, although I'm no longer going to manage it. And I, I think if your faculty have not tried it, um, it's really worth trying. One of the things I have done is I've given a lot of talks um, to other schools, telling them about what's so great about doing distance learning. The only thing is, I won't come to your campus. I'll only do it if I do it via distance learning. And I'm sure Professor Flowers, who is very good at selling distance learning, would be happy to do likewise. So if you have a school that you're in, in presenting to your faculty what can be done, we're happy to do it. Thank you very much. just got to sit at home in Colorado with my 
warm fuzzies on because it's so much colder here than it is in Florida, and enjoy that. So that's another selling point for me at least at Fox because it gave me some flexibility. Is there any research on how well students learn with this approach? It seems to me that having every student be active every week is a big improvement over the average law school class. Is it reflected in how do they do better on exams? I actually, back at Georgia State, I did one summer, I took a group of students and I taught them online, and I taught the exact same group of students using distance learning. Uh, rather, live class. So I had both going at the exact same time. One basically had nothing to do with the other, but I was teaching the exact same material, one class online and one class um, live. I had the registrar mix up all the exams, not tell me which exams were online exams and which exams were not, and I graded them all independently. I have to say the online was maybe ever so slightly above, but it came out about the same. The sample size was very small. Okay. Personally, from the courses I've seen in recent years, it seems to me that my online students are doing better. And it's basically because they can't get away with not doing the reading. They have to have read it. There is no way they can post if they haven't read the material. I'm going to know in a minute. And I'm going to shoot them an email and say, maybe you ought to go back and take a look at that tape or something in a nice way to get them to review it. So I think the learning is improved, um, but I don't have an actual study yet to uh, present. But it definitely is not decreased, I can assure you. Yeah, and in all of my online courses, I've never taught any other way except online, so I don't have anything to compare it to. I do tell you that they seem to know the rules a lot better in criminal ethics, but again, that's an advanced criminal ethics, an ethics course as opposed to my basic uh, PR course, so it's hard to compare those two because it's different. They've already had the PR class. And you now all know how I got Bobby Flowers to come here and talk today. <laughs> <laughs> so I thank you, John Mayer, for scheduling me for Colorado.